everyone, and welcome to the fifth meeting of the Committee on Scottish Government Handling of Harassment Complaints. Our first item of business is a decision to take the Committee's work programme discussion at next week's meeting in private. Can I ask members if they agree? agree. Thank you very much. We'll move on to agenda item two, uh, which is, of course, the evidence session in phase one of our inquiry. And that's on the development of the handling of harassment complaints procedure. Today's session is with trade union representatives and will include a focus on union involvement on the development of the procedure. I would remind all those present of my, my statement from the start of our meeting on 18th August uh, that we're bound by the terms of our remit and the relevant court orders, including the need to avoid contempt of court by identifying certain individuals, including through jigsaw identification. The committee as a whole has agreed that it is not our role to revisit events that were a focus of the trial that could be seen to constitute a rerun of the criminal trial. Our remit, remit is to consider and report on the actions of the First Minister, Scottish Government officials and special advisers in dealing with complaints about Alex Salmond, former First Minister, considered under the Scottish Government's handling of harassment complaints involving current or former ministers and procedures and actions in relation to the Scottish Ministerial Code. The more we get into specifics of evidence, time, people, cases, the more we run the risk of identifying those who made complaints. The more we ask about specific matters covered in the trial, including events explored in the trial, the more we run the risk of rerunning that trial. Wherever possible, please avoid discussion of the specifics of concerns or complaints, including those that predated the harassment complaints procedure being produced, and avoid naming specific government officials. With that, please to welcome Dave Penman, General Secretary of the FDA, and Malcolm Clark, Convener of the Council of Scottish Government Unions and PCS Scottish Government Group President. Can I begin by inviting Mr Penman to take the solemn affirmation? Please raise your right hand, Mr Penman, and repeat after me. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm. That I will tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. That I will tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you. I now invite Mr Clark to take the solemn affirmation. Thank you, Mr Clark. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm. I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that I will tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I will tell the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thank you very much. I now invite Mr Penman to make a very brief opening statement to explain his role in FDA and the development of the policy. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I'm General Secretary of uh, the FDA, which is a union that represents managers and professionals in public service, mainly in the civil service, but also uh, in the NHS. We tend to represent the most senior people in the civil service, been about for about 100 years, just celebrated our centenary uh, last year. Um, as you can tell from my accent, I am from these parts. I, I, I grew up in Scotland and indeed uh, worked for unions in Scotland before moving down to London and, and uh, working for the FDA. Um, I've worked for the union for 20 years, including being Deputy General Secretary and General Secretary since 2012. As a small trade union, essentially of about 18,000 members, dealing with uh, the most senior uh, civil servants in the country, then when issues around political sensitivity happen, they tend to come across my desk, which is one of the reasons why, um, uh, in terms of the evidence from FDA, it's myself who's sitting in front of you. In relation to the, 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 the matters before this committee, as we've made clear in our evidence um, that um, the dialogue around a review of the kind of existing processes for dealing with complaints around ministers first started around um, the summer of 2017. There was some informal dialogue with our trade union around um, a, a wish to have a look at the processes and the procedures. That really didn't take off until there was the explosion of concern around the Me Too movement um, and what that meant. Clearly, there were scandals in the Westminster uh, around that. Um, and as part of that, the, the civil service as a whole um, uh, took a decision to have a look at their existing policies to see whether they were fit for purpose. Um, and as part of that, Scottish Government indicated that they wished to review the process and have a look at that. 
I mean, I have to say at this point, you know, Scottish Government is still the only part of the UK civil service that has a bespoke policy for dealing with the concerns of civil servants, again, ministers, and despite three years of dialogue with the Cabinet Office, no such uh, equivalent policy exists. And as you'll be aware from events down in Westminster, you only have the ministerial code as a, a, an opportunity to raise a concern, and that is a process which is completely inadequate for dealing with such issues, and um, indeed provides no written process for dealing with any concerns. So we were in a position in terms of Scottish Government where we already had a process, but like all processes, we wanted to improve it. So as part of that dialogue, there was an exchange of views. It was, I have to say, talking to those who were negotiating at the time, a very kind of ordinary process at the time. It, it's kind of routine for us as trade unions to negotiate procedures and policies. Um, we had a, a, a series of uh, kind of informal and semi-informal uh, dialogue about principles. There was an exchange of drafts. There were comments raised by uh, all of the trade unions, including their own, and then eventually we ended up with a, a policy that came out the other side of it. So, in many ways, the creation of um, the latest iteration of this policy was an unremarkable event in some ways because it's essentially what we do as trade unions in terms of that process. We will have raised issues. We won't have got everything that we wanted. That's the nature of dialogue and, uh, and engagement in negotiations. And at the other side of it, we end up with um, uh, a policy which we had seen as an improvement on the policy that existed before. Thank you. Mr. Penman, can I ask Mr. Clark to make a brief opening statement to explain his role? Uh, in PCS Scotland and, of course, in the development of the policy. Mr Clark. Thank you. I've, I've prepared a brief statement, which I'll just read. Uh, good morning. I am Malcolm Clark, and I'm president of the Public and Commercial Services Union Group in the Scottish Government and convener of the Council of Scottish Government Unions, the umbrella body covering unions in the Scottish Government. I first joined the civil service in 1985 and, after time in Whitehall, joined the then Scottish Executive in the year 2000. Over my career, I have alternated between official and lay trade union roles. I was elected to my current union positions in May 2017. Although a serving civil servant, I appear before you today in my trade union capacity. Within the Scottish Government, I am effectively on an internal secondment to the Council of Scottish Government Unions with facility time in an ungraded post. As such, I'd be, I'd be grateful if any remarks I make this morning could be considered under the guidance for officials given evidence at Scottish Parliament, which state that elected representatives such as myself may attend and comment on policy matters with the understanding that, my, that any views expressed are as a representative of, of my union and not as a civil servant on behalf of Scottish ministers or reflecting any personal views I may hold. The Public and Commercial Services Union proposed my attendance today primarily because of my involvement in the development of the handling of harassment complaints involving current or former ministers policy document in 2017. That document was developed under the partnership arrangements that have been in place since devolution. Partnership working ensures that staff representatives are consulted and involved at all stages of policy development and helps guarantee the voices of staff are heard to the benefit of all. While such arrangements can always be improved and we still have our disputes and disagreements, I would contend that the staff and official side engagement which currently applies in the Scottish Government is the best across the UK civil service. I welcome this chance to assist the committee to the best of my ability. Consistent with declarations made last week, I am sure it will not surprise you that I confirm how I am a member of the PCS union. Thank you. Thank you very much to both of you. I will now open up to questions from members of the committee. Deputy Convener. Uh, thank you, Convener, and good morning, gentlemen. Uh, my questions will concentrate on the submissions, FDA submission, possibly um, more than the PCES one, and also the FOI um, back in February 2018, which referred to the work that went on with the unions and the Scottish Government between 2008 and 2010 to, to change the policy. And we know that from um, the FOI that there were communications between the TU uh, uh, about the development of the Fairness to Work policy in particular um, regarding complaints against ministers, that a more robust process was looked to be agreed to 
and it refers to serious allegations. Now, I'm quite keen to understand exactly how these, um, these discussions evolved, and I see there's reference to um, a central committee and board and partnership meetings, and I wonder if you could just explain exactly um, who attended these, um, how frequently they met, and what the union's expectation was of the issues raised at these meetings. Would they expect them to, to go to the cabinet? Would they expect them to go to the, the um, permanent secretary? What would they expect to get back on who would be briefed? Well, there's, was there a, a specific minister um, that would be briefed on uh, what was discussed and decided at these meetings? Mr Penman, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, obviously, I, I've spoken to uh, representatives who were involved at that time. Unfortunately, our national officer who was involved at that time has, has sadly passed away this year. Um, but clearly, the issues that, that have been around over the last few years, we have discussed these issues and the creation of that first policy between 2008 and 2010. Um, I mean, I don't have detail of exactly how many meetings or, or, or who attended I think to understand industrial relations is to understand that what trade unions are trying to do is influence, and, and influence can be exerted in many ways. Quite often that takes place with dialogue and informal dialogue, particularly in an organisation where essentially you have quite a good, and as Malcolm's referred to, quite a positive relationship between the employer and the trade unions. So my understanding around the dialogue at that point in time, as you can imagine, in terms of civil servants, there will have been existing policies like most large organisations, there were already policies for dealing with issues around bullying and harassment, and that was relatively straightforward. You're always looking to improve it, but it would have been a relatively long-term and established process for, for dealing and handling those sorts of issues. At that point in time, when there was to be a review of that policy, there were concerns that had been raised with us as a trade union about the conduct of ministers. And I need to make clear here that that was multiple ministers and multiple administrations. Um, and uh, as a result of that, we saw in, in partnership with other trade unions and with the employer to try to have essentially that, that process for dealing with complaints for employees expanded to include, um, uh, include ministers. And that's quite, you know, that's quite a difficult dynamic because ministers are not employees. As we have discovered in, in the work we've been doing in the House of Commons around this, there's a very real issue where you don't have an employment relationship with an individual, but you're es essentially trying to expand an employment set of rules to individuals who cannot necessarily even be compelled uh, to cooperate. So it was quite an unusual thing and, and quite a dynamic thing to do, but it was done on the basis that there were concerns that were being raised about behaviours. Um, to such a degree that we felt that there had to be a, a process put in place. So as part of that dialogue and review of that process, that was one of the objectives that, that, that the unions had as a result of it. Have you any idea who attended um, the central committee meetings or the partnership meetings? I mean, I think there's an expectation the partnership meetings involved HR and um, perhaps some Scottish government officials. It's important to understand, you know, who was deciding um, or who was attending these meetings? That's my initial question. Right. So, I mean, my understanding would be would be our representatives at the time, and occasionally mm -hmm. our national officer would be involved in those as well. Okay. I mean, again, although uh, this is unusual in relation to the expansion of the ministers, this is a, a relatively normal process. So it would be dealt with by the representatives who are dealing with the day-to-day -day industrial relations of, of, of the union from our side. And we would expect the same on the other side. It would be the normal HR functions and through the normal industrial relation processes. Would that be your understanding? Yes, um, I, I was a, a, a trade union official at the time. I, I don't think I had too much involvement in the development of that policy. It was colleagues uh, on, on largely, as I recall it. But it would have been largely engagement between uh, the unions through the CSGU at that time and with um, HR and uh, people services uh, colleagues. It would be largely... I can't really recall any sort of 
external involvement, you know, beyond perhaps the occasional involvement of full-time officials for the unions as well. Expectation that what was discussed at these meetings would go to the cabinet or the permanent secretary. There would be some involvement, perhaps permanent secretary even attended in some time, mm. or head of HR attended. You know that that would be flagged up um, to the Scottish government in some form. Mm. As, as far as I, like, like I say, that because you know, I wasn't directly involved, I'm not. You know, I've, I've, I've seen the FOI that you refer to, and I note that you know a lot of the names are redacted. I'm not even sure myself exactly who they may be relating to. But it's probably worth noting that at that time, it was about moving from what was called a dignity at work policy to a fairness at work policy. It seems semantics, but there was also significant change to the policy. It was improved a lot. And quite frankly, well, it, I think, as I recall, it was the unions that were keen that we did introduce a particular element dealing with the engagement with ministers. Yeah, yep. policy and ask them some specific questions. We know that HR had um, come out with a policy and ensured that ministers would be covered um, because the unions had said it would be unacceptable if fairness of work no longer did that. And the initial policy that HR came out with, including going directly to the permanent secretary and the permanent secretary complaint, then going to the deputy first minister to work as arbitrator, and then there would be a conciliation process. The unions... Um, rejected that and they rejected that my understanding because HR um, should be involved earlier and that it wasn't acceptable or appropriate for ministers to, ministers to investigate ministers. So um, this was taken on board I think by the, the permanent secretary then I think that would be Sir John Elvidge at that time who then raised the points with, uh, about the history of bad behaviour, inappropriate um, for ministers to investigate ministers. And also, um, I think the trade unions at that point were sufficiently annoyed that um, if they didn't get the procedure back by a certain date, I think it was the end of January, they were going to go to ACAS and it was made clear that if that happened, there would be um, scrutiny outside uh, Scottish Government and there may well be press interest. So my question is, um, taking cognizance of that, the Permanent Secretary then um, went to the First Minister to look at these policies. Was that appropriate if the First Minister may have been the subject of uh, these complaints? Because we know in the policy, if the Deputy First Minister had been the subject of the complaints, then that was to go to another Cabinet Secretary, another Minister. Could I have your view on that? I mean, I think you go to one of the kind of heart of one of the problems we deal with when you deal with government, in that ultimately the people who have to sanction at times, who have the, the authority around approving a policy or a procedure, are the people that that might apply to. And that it's very difficult to separate those issues. It's, it's one of the difficulties around any policy um, and one of the reasons why I believe there should be a, a wholly independent process. But, I mean, essentially, when we're dealing with Scottish Government as an employer, we expect the officials who sit on the underside of the table to have whatever the appropriate authority they need to reach an agreement. We don't necessarily go into that on each, each and individual Specifically, case. Specifically, there was, in the previous policy, covering the situation where the de Deputy Prime uh, uh, First Minister might be the subject of a complaint. And if that was the case, it would not go and pass her door. She wouldn't look at it. It would then be um, another minister. So taking on board the, um, the, the concerns about ministerial behaviour, was it appropriate that this went to the First Minister, this new policy, which was bringing in HR which was more informal and which um, then still involved the Deputy First Minister. And at that time, I believe it was Nicola Sturgeon. Was yeah. it important that it went to um, the, the First Minister? Given, you know, you're aware of lots of serious allegations, you're aware that there's a culture in ministerial offices and that the seniority of the person can, um, can stop the discussion going as it should. Was that appropriate? And what was your view of the new revised policy and the informal basis you um, requested? 
I mean, if I can pick up that point about whether it's appropriate, we're dealing with a policy that applies across um, uh, the government and across the all ministers. You're not dealing with specific allegations about an individual. So having a, a minister involved in a process of, of authorising a policy, because that's part of their job as a minister, even though some elements of that may apply to them, is the only way we can get an agreement with Scottish Government. I mean, if we don't go to the Minister or the First Minister, where, how, do, how do you get a decision? How, do you, how does the Scottish Government Civil Service get political buy-in? It wasn't dealing with any individual uh, uh, in relation to that. It was dealing with, the, in the broadest sense, the policy. A absolutely, we would prefer this to be wholly independent. We would prefer not to have to involve ministers in any decision-making, including the process itself, around how these issues are dealt with. But at that point in time, when it was the first government department that had done anything, where actually we were getting improvements in the policy... I then understand that. I, I don't uh, think... We're I don't not dealing with the specifics. Can I therefore ask, as my last question here, did any policy, did any complaint or um, expressions of concern about inappropriate behaviour uh, go in an informal basis or a formal basis to the stage of permanent secretary and the Deputy First Minister in, in your experience during that period, 2008 to 2010, particularly 2010 under the revised policy and thereafter? Not that I'm aware of. I, I, I think we're aware of, which is why the, the policy was being pushed by the trade unions in the first place, of concerns that were being raised by members about ministerial behaviour. And that though up to the point that the policy was in existence, the only way that could be dealt with would be in an informal basis of it raising concerns. And clearly, post-policy, there was an opportunity to use that policy and raise those concerns. And I believe individuals did raise those concerns, whether it was informally or formally. Um, I, I'm unclear about in terms of numbers, but that, that issues were raised both prior to the policy and post the policy. With the Permanent Secretary and the Deputy First Minister? I, I don't know whether it went to the Deputy First Minister. I would have thought, given the nature of the concerns, if they were raised about a minister, they would have reached the Permanent Secretary's door. I think if you look at the evidence from the two previous Perm Secs, uh -huh. they have indicated... Sorry to interrupt you, but I think you say in your submission you did raise with um, a number of Permanent Secretaries. These yes. Concerns. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on. Um, Alex Cole-Hamilton, please, and then we'll move on to Maureen Mott. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning to our witnesses. Welcome to the committee. Um, I have two baskets of questions, and as I did last week, I'll, I'll break between the second before the second to allow other members in. Um, can I start by saying that the FDA submission introduced some very worrying revelations? Firstly, that bullying and harassment allegations, and I quote, stood out quite significantly when compared to the rest of the UK civil service, particularly against ministers. All told, there were some 30 complaints made against five ministerial officers over 10 years. Should we infer from this that incidents of bullying and harassment were just more prevalent among Scottish ministers? I think that that's, that's one of the most difficult things for us to assess. What we can talk about is what do we know? And so as we have sat down with a group of reps and officials and say, as, as we collated our evidence, what, what do we think? What do we understand in terms of the numbers? And that's where this figure of 30 came up. And that's, that's why I, I included it in the evidence, because it's... Um, for me, as I indicated in my opening statement, as General Secretary of a small union that deals with the most senior staff, normally issues in relation to the ministers, I you be aware over the last few months, there have been quite a few, um, uh, in Whitehall, would come to my door as, as General Secretary. And so, whilst um, uh, there's not a guarantee, that doesn't mean that issues haven't been raised or concerns haven't been dealt with elsewhere, or people may not be trade union members, it still seemed to stand out that what we would be dealing with would be a handful of cases across Whitehall, so across the rest of the UK government, yet when we looked at it as a group of representatives, we could account for about 30 people who had approached us as members with concerns. That doesn't mean they raised complaints, it doesn't mean it went through a formal process, but 30 individual members over a period of more than a decade who have come forward with concerns about ministerial behaviour. Now that suggests to me, looking at the, uh, the cultural issue, which is what the committee asked about, in relation to Scottish Government and comparing that to other government departments, that there seems to be a much more significant prevalence of those issues that we are aware of. 
Um, it's not empirical evidence because it doesn't guarantee that necessarily people in other government departments might not have dealt with it differently. But it so does seem quite extraordinary, yeah. given the, the sort of numbers that we're talking about. That's what it would suggest. Um, we also learned in the submission from Sir Peter, Sir Peter Housen, who was the Permanent Secretary at the time that Mr Salmond was First Minister, that allegations of bullying and harassment were addressed to him in, and, and I quote from his submission, ad hominem terms. He said that complaints would be dealt with by him personally and informally, and it speaks to the general hum of concern about Alex Salmond and others that we now know existed at the time. To what extent are the 30 complaints that FDA heard about and which needed union involvement just the tip of the iceberg and would you say that a much bigger number of concerns were also being dealt with informally um, by through the permanent secretary so, so i think that's impossible for us to, to know you know we, we just like as i say I, I don't know whether in terms of complaints in our government departments have been dealt with i don't know whether in terms of people who weren't members of the trade union they would have gone elsewhere or whether they, they are the, the people that sir peter and other talk about it sort of drilled down onto that point um, so so you you would expect, though, that there were additional concerns that never were never raised with the unions that members of staff would try and seek to resolve informally, internally. I mean, I have no doubt that that would have been the case. Okay. Not everyone's a trade union member. And, and so, in, so whether it's a tip of an iceberg, to use that in terms of kind of numerical terms, that no, I, is what I, yeah, you're trying to do, or whether, absolutely. you know, or what it does, it's impossible for us to tell. And, and then the data f that we have from the People Survey and research held by both of your unions suggests that the majority of staff didn't have a great deal of confidence in uh, complaints processes within the Scottish Government, and they said that they wouldn't even raise concerns informally, citing concerns about confidentiality and indeed on the impact of their career. Does that suggest then yet another third tier of concerns that might even never have seen the light of day, that would never even be raised with the line manager for those fears that those, st those staff cited? Clearly. I mean, I think you would find that in terms of any organisation in relation to concerns, whether it's just employment concerns or government, you're obviously going to have groups of people who raise concerns through the union, those who raise them individually and those who don't have confidence to raise them um, themselves. So inevitably, any organisation is going to face those kind of three categories. What is quite clear, though, from the concerns that were raised with us was that there was a lack of confidence. I think we've tried to summarise that um, over because it was about culture and it's about over the longer term that people were concerned, I think, about how effective the process would be for dealing with it. Um, whether a culture had developed where individuals felt that having seen issues occur, that they weren't addressed and they were repeated, and therefore they felt that there, there would be not a lot of point in raising them. And people obviously concerned, as you would do in any of those circumstances, about what it would mean for them. Inevitably, anyone raising a complaint against someone in power worries about what the impact would be on uh, their career. And organisations need to work really hard to ensure that actually the most powerful in any organisation can be held to account in a way that builds confidence for those who want to raise a complaint. But it's quite clear from the evidence that we've had from members, that's not where people felt the organisation was. Yeah, thank you. And final question before I uh, give over to other members and, and come back in later. If there was such a deep level of concern over three layers, those uh, the, the ones that you heard about as a union, the ones that were raised with line managers and dealt with just internally and informally, and then the ones that never saw the light of day, why did it take until 2017 for people to start suggesting that we needed a policy to deal with the behaviour of ministers and former ministers? Well, it wasn't, because in 2010, we dealt with the issue around ministers. So, and that was specifically, as we've indicated earlier in evidence, that in relation to not, that... Not current ministers, but... Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was, that, and that was current ministers. Um, but so I, should, I phrased that badly. I, my question should have been, why did it take until 2017 if there was this uh, sort of pathway of wreckage behind uh, ministers who'd left office? Why did it take until 2017 for staff and unions to recognise there was a gap in the market there for a complaints process which addressed the behaviours of former ministers? It's a fair point, and I think in relation to how these policies develop and what you do as a trade union um, and as an employer, then you're dealing with the day-to-day -day and you're dealing with multiple people dealing with it. A lot of these may be concerns that individuals have raised confidentially with one of our representatives that don't necessarily, you don't find out as an organisation that you've got that breadth. It's only since we reviewed this that we actually recognised that 30 number because we, we sat and we thought about it. That doesn't necessarily always make itself be, uh, uh, or, or be understandable or clear to, to a tr from a trade union point of view. 
uh, so that we recognise there's someone to deal with. You're then, in the main, dealing with when uh, issues around bullying harassment around the, the, the event as it's happening. So you're thinking about people as, you know, like in an employment context, people who are currently employees, who are currently ministers. You know, it would be unusual to have a situation where you had a policy that dealt with previous employees. So again, there's a very particular and unusual dynamic around ministers and therefore former ministers about it um, and why you would want to do that. So it's something that evolves, I think, over time and over experience. And you're always constantly trying to improve it. It's very difficult for us as a trade union. Our job is to try and protect employees. And when we sit and say, well, why did we not think of that seven years previously, of course, inevitably you revise these things in light of experience and understanding. And I think, to be honest, most employers, um, politicians and society had quite a significant moment around that time in 2017 when we perhaps sat on our laurels and then recognised actually as a result of the revelations that were coming that we had to do better. And it allowed everyone to think about that and move forward. Would you like to add anything to... Uh, to that, Mr. Clark. No, well, um, uh, as with previous answers, um, Dave's given quite a quite extensive uh, response there. But I, I would just add, you know, and as has already been commented upon, but you know, um, when this policy was developed in 2010. We were the first uh, to develop anything with regard to ministers. We, we still largely are in, in that position. So it was sort of groundbreaking. Now, you know, uh, you know, hindsight is a great thing. And if there could have been more done around former ministers, we'd have probably introduced that earlier as well. But Dave also highlights, I think, quite a significant point in regard to that. When we're looking at employees, it will be you know, usually around current employees. Perhaps the additional factor that was introduced in 2017 was looking at matters of sexual misconduct. And obviously, they have more of a historical character. And so when the focus went there, then it seemed a lot more appropriate that we also look at the position with regard to, to former ministers. So I, I suppose that was an added justification round about that time. Can, can I ask, just to get it clear in my own mind, in 2010, the policy was brought in about current ministers. Can I ask who instigated that, um, where that wish for that to happen came from, and what discussions were going on simultaneously with other administrations in the UK? I'll, I'll cover the Scottish uh, Government position anyway. And um, so, well, it, it was, yeah, let's just think. Um, back, back in, yeah. Uh, 2010, it, as I recall anyway, it was the, it was the unions that were, were particularly keen to, to introduce this element into the policy. Now, with regard to the position elsewhere, you know, as we've said, we don't, we don't believe it was, it was really uh, present anywhere else, was it? No. It's not, and it's been uh, an issue for us over a long period of time, both in, as you'll be aware, quite significant issues in, in Parliament and House of Commons, and in terms of how it would be dealt with across the rest of the UK civil service with the ministerial code and the cabinet office. And to be honest, uh, a, a lack of willingness over a long period of time to really address this mm -hmm. in the sort of way that the Scottish Government had. Um, so um, uh, although there's clearly an examination of, of, of things that went wrong, I think it is an important thing to remember that, you know, this, this was, you know, a decade later from that initial policy, mm -hmm. still the only area that has anything like this kind of meaningful set out process where people can can see if they do raise a complaint, how it would be dealt with. Just, just yes, it. please. It, it, it's worth noting that back in 2010, as mentioned earlier, it was within the context of a major revision of the overarching policy. This was only one clause, one, one element, a very important one, <laughs> and, and clearly as subsequent events have shown. But nonetheless, it, it was only one part of a totally revised policy that we were seeking and largely applying to all, you know, it was for all staff and it was about, really about happening and, you know, what was happening in the workplace. You know, engagement with ministers was, was like I say, a relatively small part of that at that time. Just ask one little question. You talked about, um, Mr Cole Hamilton raised it, a lack of confidence in the process. Um, is that something you would generally find as representatives across the civil service? Uh, I think it, it depends, you know, each government department's an employer, each has its own culture, they have 
ministers who set behavioural standards, they have senior managers who do that. So most of them will have a fairly mature process for dealing with these. And so if you look at when we do surveys, or if you look at the people survey that's done across the civil service, then issues, particularly around bullying and harassment, tend to kind of um, flow uh, and, and, and peak in different departments at different times. So that confidence around handling it can be different, different departments. When we did our survey in response to the, to the Me Too movement, I think it would be fair to say that the general response was a lack of confidence across the piece. So I think there, was a, a, there were themes there around how not so much the, a bit like the issues you're dealing with in Scottish Government, not so much whether the policy was right, but how it was implemented, how it was resourced, whether there were outcomes. Um, and a lack of confidence in that would probably be the picture across most of the civil service. But that is to a greater or lesser extent in different employers at different times. Thank you. Go to Maureen Watt and then on to Alistair Allen. Thank you, convener. Good morning, gentlemen. Can I just get clear in my mind that um, the development of a policy in Scotland in relation to this came as a result of what was happening across the administrations but was in instigated, if you like, specifically by Westminster in terms of what had arisen out of the uh, survey that went to all members across the UK. So, are you talking about the 2017 or 20? Mm -hmm. 2017. Yeah, 2017. Th there had been some dialogue uh, in the summer of 2017 about looking at a revision, but it was a relatively informal dialogue that there was potentially going to review how the process applied how it applied, whether there was a separation of how it dealt with ministers or, or civil servants, but that never went anywhere. And then, as a result of the Me Too moment, the UK civil service took it on board to review all of its procedures, and that was the catalyst then for a review of the, the Scottish government's procedures. And, of course, that, that applied across every government department. So you're saying that the Scottish government were the only ones who really took it up and ran with it, and the others, are you're still waiting for similar policies? In, in relation to ministers that would sit um, uh, with the Cabinet Office, that would require the Cabinet Office under the Ministerial Code to make changes for most other government departments rather than it being uh, uh, themselves, any number of government departments will have looked at their own processes for dealing with bullying and harassment, because at that point it wasn't just about ministers, it was about the entire process and sought to, to make improvements. So we've been in dialogue with dozens of government departments about minor changes there was a review done centrally and a report produced centrally about recommendations going forward for the entire civil service. So you've got that kind of process ongoing um, uh, either in departments or across the whole civil service. In the Scottish Government context, they were looking at their processes, how it applied to individuals, civil servants, and obviously as the only government department with one that applied to ministers, they were looking at that aspect as well. So it was the only place where those two things were looked at at once. So to be clear, you're saying that the Scottish Government is the only department of the whole civil service that has actually got a policy in relation to ministers. If elsewhere it's the ministerial code, so if you look at what's happening in Whitehall just now, there's been an investigation under the ministerial code uh, uh, for the home, uh, against the Home Secretary uh, as a result of allegations that came to the fore uh, uh, around bullying. That investigation is conducted by the Cabinet Office. And there is no written procedure for dealing with that, that the decision on whether the, the minister has breached the ministerial code sits with the prime minister and has done now um, uh, for several months. And there are no rights of any individual who raises complaints or any process for dealing with it or how they can challenge or how that decision will be made. And it's only a decision of whether the minister has breached the ministerial code. That is the only process that applies to the rest of the UK civil service. So, unions, would you rather see what's happening in Scotland in the terms of the Fairness to Work policy and the Ministerial Code be replicated elsewhere in the UK? Yeah, but actually, we think through experience we need to go further. I think the, the experience both in terms of government departments and Parliament demonstrate that you need a wholly independent process, both to be fair to employees and employers. The first question, or, or second question we were asked was that whole point, how can those people who are essentially are going to be judged by a process make a decision on what that process should be, or indeed be involved in decision-making uh, either way? And as we're seeing, for example, just now in relation to uh, the issue in Whitehall, we've got a Prime Minister sitting on a report, 
presumably making some political decision around what decision is made and when that decision is made, rather than actually a proper decision about dealing with the concerns that were raised. So we believe, as we've been able to successfully achieve in Parliament, and it's the same dynamics that apply, essentially, politicians, whether in Parliament or in government, can't mark their own homework on this. And you need independence of investigation, and you need independence of decision-making, and critically, transparency around the whole process. Are the unions consulted on the, any revisions of the ministerial code at all? Um, there's a, a very kind of light touch um, consultation process that would take, a, take um, place on issues like that. We have been in dialogue with the Cabinet Office for three years about this unsuccessfully. It isn't like dealing with an employer in Scottish Government where you have that kind of relationship. Um, and uh, the frustrations for us have come to the fore uh, in relation to this issue particularly around what happened in the Home Office and the kind of inadequacy of the, of the process for dealing with it. Specifically in Scotland, were you involved in the last revision of the Ministerial Code here? Was, it, was a draft shown to you or anything? I don't, I don't think so, but I don't, I don't know specifically, I don't to be honest. So. I don't think so, but okay. can't recall exactly. In terms of the development of the Fairness at Work policy, was it developed in the same way as you would say other policies that you might be involved in or did you feel it was rushed in any way or was it kind of normal procedure for well, the development of a policy? Well the one uh, that was still operating under is the 2010 Fairness and Work Policy and certainly the uh, Freedom of Information um, if they are, that is uh, mentioned earlier it was over an extended period, I think it was about 18 months or something like that, that it took to actually uh, finalise that policy. Now, obviously, there was the, you know, the, the more bespoke ministerial um, policy that was developed 2017-2018. That, that was undertaken it, you know, at pace, uh, you know, I would say, um, but it was a very specific, narrow uh, piece of work. Um, and you know, the time scale seemed appropriate at the time. When you are involved in a policy like that, what um, professional advice do you have either within your organisation or do you take in terms of uh, HR policy? It'll, it'll, it'll depend on the circumstances. Um, as Dave was mentioned earlier, we'll often involve full-time officers with their expertise. Sometimes we might even take it to legal and you know, you know, um, other support within the union. It all depends on the circumstances. Can you start in, you know, in an employment context? You know, we deal with hundreds of employers, both unions, you know, and, and, and therefore there's a broad experience around dealing with these HR matters. As I said in the opening evidence, in, in, in many ways, although this is now the subject of, of an inquiry, it, it was an unremarkable process in relation to you've got an HR process, there's consultation, we seek our expertise, we try and reach agreement between the unions, we feed in uh, ideas, comments for revisions, employers take them on board or don't, and you reach agreement. It's what we do every day with hundreds of employers, so, so relatively kind of unremarkable. And as trade unions, we obviously, um, depending upon the issue at hand, whether we've got the, the expertise for the individual that's involved, we've got a broad range of experts that work for the union or and the other unions, and of course, if need be, we would even seek legal advice. So, but that's what we do every day. Okay, and did uh, the unions have any contact with special advisors during the, the development of the policy on harassment complaints? I, I, don't, think, I don't think in particular we would have consulted or involved with, with special advisors. You know, we'd be concerned that as a group of employees, they would be covered by it as well, both in terms of if they wanted to raise a complaint or if there were concerns about special advisor behaviour, which of course there has been at times uh, in the past. So, but we wouldn't have consulted them in, in, in relation to the, the specific policy of that. We'd be dealing with that through our internal processes. And if I uh, heard you correctly, you said that you had 30 members in Scotland specifically complain about ministers. Over what time frame was that, and how does that compare um, to the whole civil, civil service or other administrations in particular? So that, that was a figure that, uh, from talking to the representatives um, uh, for FDA, it was in our evidence, um, we uh, felt that that was about the number who had come forward to us to raise complaints, either 
concerns about ministerial behaviour which never went anywhere and were just to individuals or ones that we were aware of might have been taken forward either on an informal or informal basis. That would be over a period of about a decade that we're talking about. Um, the reason why we raised it in the evidence is that um, I would be aware over a similar period for the rest of the UK civil service probably about a handful of instances that came to the union. Um, and that would be for the rest of the UK civil service, which is why for us it felt quite remarkable in terms of numbers. That's, as we explored earlier, is no guarantee. It's not empirical evidence. It's only the evidence that we've got as a trade union. But normally those issues would have come and been made aware to the, to the general secretary. Or certainly I, I would be aware that there was a ministerial issue that was in the offing, either from our team or from the cabinet office team, if that was the case. So it did feel like there's an unusual number in Scottish Government compared to the rest of the UK civil service. Okay, thank you. Alistair Allen, and then on to Angela Constance. Thank you, convener. If I can um, maybe ask a pair of you to respond to some of the, the themes that were picked up by uh, those previously giving evidence uh, to the committee. Uh, a number of members uh, here today have, have referred to this issue about how unions um, uh, lobbied, if that's the right word, I think, for a more independent element uh, in the, uh, the process that was being devised for complaints. Um, we have heard from previous witnesses that an independent element, if you like, would be no, more normal at the end of a process than the beginning. And I just wondered if you had any views on that or, or wh where you felt that an independent process could have been inserted more profitably. Uh, I, I think we all learn from experience of, of this. Um, as you go through it. And for us as a trade union, we have developed that as a kind of a, a policy objective over a period of time. Um, we raised it as part of the process here. Um, it, was, it would be a relatively novel idea at the time. Um, we were pursuing it, as you'll be aware, in House of Commons, where we ultimately were able to, to achieve that. It's a thing that I think we feel as part of our experience that, as I said earlier, ultimately, if you want to build confidence amongst employees and, I think, for ministers themselves, having something that, that's quick, that's independent, um, and that there is no potential for conflict of interest is really the best way to deal with this in the kind of unique circumstances that you have in relation to the role of government ministers in an employment context. And similarly, when it comes to politicians as members of, of parliament as well, where they were kind of controlling their own destiny and the, the similar sort of conflict. So, so that independent issue is something that we have evolved as a policy objective over a period of time. We raised that as part of these discussions. Um, it wasn't something that Scottish government wanted to do at the time. Um, uh, and therefore, we were seeking improvements and changes, like you know, any number of things that you raise as a union, you, you don't necessarily get. But I think, in light of everything that's happened, it would seem that that I would hope is a conclusion that most people would reach. That actually, when you're dealing with these issues, then when you're dealing with bullying, harassment, and what that ultimately is, which is an abuse of power, then you have to balance that power somehow. And in relation to how governments work and how the, the ministers. Um, have that power in relation to a government department, then it means you need to take it outside of that and there needs to be a process outside of that. And I think, honestly, that that would be better for ministers as well as for civil servants in building confidence in a process. I would, I would, uh, just like to add, I would concur with that. And if feasible, I, I would like to see that principle extended a little bit further. You know, as has been noted and you know, uh, mentioned at different points, you know, the civil service itself and even in Scottish Government remains an extremely hierarchical organisation. Um, there, there can be challenges at other levels as well because of the power dynamic and if there was some opportunity and some avenue for people to take uh, significant matters. Um, out with the normal chain, I, I think I think that would, that would be a positive step, and it would probably instil a lot more confidence in, in, in some of the procedures that we have. But particularly with regard to the, the ministerial element, I can and certainly see the arguments there. There was a degree, you know, a greater degree of independence in the civil service in the past. There was the civil service appeal board. That's all be, been eradicated. Um, I think under the coalition, for instance, up here, we, we've not done anything to replace that. You know, in, in Scotland and other areas, uh, as an example. So, yeah, 
anything that could be done to try and address the sort of hierarchy that we have to deal with, I, I think would be very welcome. I appreciate the, the argument you're making that um, government is different from other employment situations for the reasons that you've, you've outlined very persuasively. But just, just to be clear on this, are, you, are your arguments for an independent element early on in the process based around that? Or is that something you would like to see? Or is, this, is it your position that this should be happening in other employment settings? I think for us, the, the critical issue here is around um, uh, the issue of ministers, and that um, if you, uh, you know, if you think about it in terms of that issue around the power dynamic, you know, those issues around having you know civil servants investigating ministers, how you then get to a point of a decision-making process, who knows what when, all of those issues that have come to the fore uh, around this process, you would take all of that out. In relation to this and the influence of of political parties and in, in processes um, and and you would say that is dealt with from day one in a wholly independent process from the potential influence that could be had in in relation to that i think that's quite unique when it comes to to ministers and the, the power of ministers in, in in government departments and indeed uh, as i've said um in parliament um and i think that's that's to the benefit of both ministers and employees. So I think we would want to see that independence and transparency from the moment that an individual had a, a, an issue that they could uh, raise a concern about. And I think that would give confidence to all sides in relation to this. Thank you. Uh, from, from evidence that we've heard and, and we've, we've read um, in this committee, uh, it's clear that the, the unions were involved um, in the development of the process, you, you've indicated areas that you, you, you asked for that you, you didn't get. But what did it feel like from the, the union's perspective in terms of timeframes? Do you feel the process was being expedited in any way towards uh, in the course of, of 2017? Uh, was, was the time scale a normal time scale? There's, there's, there's a clear ambition to get something on, on the books fairly quickly around this for understandable reasons. It was in the public eye and um, there was also you know, a lot of political interest around the issue. And the unions were, were, were pleased to engage on, on that basis because we also recognised the value that, that could come out of this. It was the process, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it, it was conducted at pace. There, there's no denying that. But even... But then it was a very, you know, although the document, um, you know, is relatively long at what, about four pages or whatever, it was a very narrow, um, you know, uh, piece of guidance, really, or a piece of policy. And so, you know, I, I think the time scales were appropriate for what we were trying to achieve at that time. As I mentioned earlier, you know, when we looked at the broad you know, fairness at work policy, that took a lot more time, and understandably so. Um, but yeah, certainly around about 2017, 18, yeah, it, it was a narrow piece, and so yeah, the time scale seemed right. Thank you. Uh, finally, uh, convener, one of the other areas that we've, we've touched on in evidence so far has been around the whole uh, issue of lived experience, and I really offer that as an open-ended question to, to invite you to make some comment on on how you feel that should or, or does fit into this process? <laughs> um, I mean, I think as we've said, you know, kind of hindsight's 2020. We, I mean, I don't want to repeat myself about independence, but I think had this been an independent, a wholly independent process from day one, I think we would have a different outcome from this. We wouldn't necessarily be here. Um, uh, I think part of the difficulty when you're dealing with government is you're dealing with politics and everyone everyone around this table has got their own um, uh, agenda that they that they want to pursue it's very difficult to separate out those issues and we're dealing with just employees and essentially what would be an employment issue and i don't mean to to uh, be rude there but just to be clear about what i meant because i appreciate my, my question was a very open-ended one indeed uh, i'm talking about whether you felt it was appropriate or is appropriate in general to involve people with lived experiences of the issues um, that lie behind the policy, um, being involved in the development of the policy? Well, 
Certainly, the way we undertake negotiations in the Scottish Government, it will be engagement between people services or you know, senior management in specific areas and with the unions. It, it's not you know, directly with individuals or inviting them along to the meetings for their own lived experiences. You know, I, I now appreciate you know, um, what, what you're touching on there. And, and that was something that was undertaken by our colleagues in HR, so I understand you know, that, that, that wouldn't be the way that we would undertake. Uh, certainly, we go to members. We're very keen to get their views, their input into you know, different aspects. You know, Dave's mentioned you know, the, the survey that they undertook. Um, it's, 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 it's in the, the FDA um, note. You know, PCS has also undertaken earlier this year a, a survey on bullying and harassment. You know, so we draw on those sort of documents and input from members, but you know, it, it wouldn't be, you know, we wouldn't be going in there with, well, these members have experienced this behaviour, and you know, no, we, we take we take their views in on their behalf, and certainly that's the way that we approach uh, negotiations. And in many ways, what an employer does in negotiating and consulting with a trade union is getting lived experience. As trade unions, we, you know, we've talked about 30 people come to us over that period of decade. We'll hear stories about what happened. They'll explain frustrations they've had in processes. We have that broad experience. That's what trade unions do. We take that employee experience and imply it and try and inform what an employer does. And a good employer listens to that as the legitimate voice of employees. And so that's where you get that kind of lived experience. And um, rather than going to one individual or certain individuals who have their own narrow element of that, as a trade union, our job is to try and understand what that means across the piece, relate that to our experience elsewhere and try and apply that in terms of a, a process that happens. So lived experience is essentially what we do every day as trade unions when we represent the interests of our members and, and negotiate with an employer. Thank you, can do that. Just before we go to Angela Quinson, these 30 people, what happened? What did the union do? Uh, I mean, it's, it's 30 individuals over a decade. Mm -hmm. there'll be, there will be individuals in there who we have counselled, advised, and who have done nothing, who have not taken it forward, individuals who will have raised it informally, and individuals who would have raised it perhaps more, more formally. You know, and it will be a range of issues that they've raised I mean, we've, mm -hmm. we've summarised that as a total number, but you'll have quite potentially extremes of behaviour and issues that you'll be dealing with there and relatively low level things as well. So, so inevitably, again, as trade unions, that, that's what happens. You know, people come to us and quite often that doesn't result in anything. We are the kind of safe space where people come, talk through an issue, and they ultimately have to have control over what happens. So whether we may feel they should make a formal complaint or not, ultimately it's down to that individual whether they decide to take that forward or not. What's quite clear, as we've raised from our evidence as well, is increasingly people did not have confidence. You normally get that in a range of issues about bullying, harassment or that. Every union will have that kind of experience. I talk to members. I think our perception over time was that increasingly people were talking to us on the basis that they didn't feel confident of going to that next stage, even if that's what we were recommending. Angela Constance and then Alison Johnson. Our panel, if I could pick up on the issue of independent external scrutiny, please. Um, a few weeks ago, the Permanent Secretary told this committee that the issue of whether we should have an independent element was not uh, raised by the unions. Uh, Westminster followed us with a, a written procedure and has subsequently been uh, pressured by the FDA successfully to include an independent element. Yet, in the written evidence from the FDA, you said you were actively involved throughout 2017 and we're pressing for independent scrutiny uh, regarding processes of complaints against ministers in all administrations. So could you just clarify um, what it was you were aspiring to achieve in 2017? And just for the record, um, what you have achieved and what you have still to achieve. Um, I, I saw that evidence. It, it doesn't surprise me that the Perm Secretary might not be aware of a dialogue that was taking place with HR around a process development, you know, three years previously. So I, I've talked to our representatives um, subsequent to that. It was raised in dialogue. It was raised, at, I think, at a specific meeting that took place in the middle of December. 
Um, because again, we were, as a trade union, were developing that policy um, in relation to what was happening mainly around Parliament. To be honest, that was the big driver for, uh, in the focus for us as a union. And as a result of that, it was clear that this issue of conflict of interest and how you would deal with it would be one that would be solved by independence through all processes, whether that was government or whether it was parliament. So it was an emerging and developing policy initiative from us, but it was specifically raised as part of, of, of the dialogue, um, I think in mid-December, when, when um, the first drafts of the new procedure were produced. There was no appetite for that from Scottish government, and whether we should push harder or not, I think we recognised that, that we were in a, an advantageous place compared to the rest of the UK civil service and therefore actually in terms of processes you never get everything that you want as a trade union and you move on and that's how that was that that, that was dealt with um, as I've indicated several times it's still the only part of the UK civil service with that sort of, of, of policy and process we we had a major achievement around the House of Commons that was a two and a half year battle around that uh, about full independence only achieved in June, I think, when Parliament finally voted uh, to absent itself from any decision-making in relation to issues around um, uh, 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 investigations uh, on MPs uh, and sanctions on MPs. In terms of uh, government institutions, this remains the only place. And as we have seen in relation to the Home Office investigation, I think it has laid bare the inadequacies and potential conflicts of the current position in the rest of Whitehall, where the Prime Minister stood in Parliament, said he was backing the Home Secretary before an investigation had even been conducted, knowing that that investigation was going to come to his desk to make a decision. And therefore, if that's, which is essentially where you have the position in, in, in terms of the rest of the UK civil service, no one is going to have confidence in how that, that, that's any kind of form of independent process. Okay, that's a, a clear articulation of the benefits of an, an independent process and obviously it's for committee to um, pick up um, why, you know, at the height of the policy development in mid-December 2017 that there was perhaps less than fluid communication between HR and the Permanent Secretary. But if I could um, quote from evidence we heard uh, last week from Nicola Richards who uh, we're led to believe uh, led the engagement uh, with the trade union when she said the harassment policy was quite unusual uh, normally when we bring in a policy we have an extensive uh, process with trade unions yet um, I think it was yourself Mr Penman um, had said that you know your engagement around this actually felt quite normal and I wonder if you could, um, both the panel, g give your view about um, how unique in reality were the challenges around developing uh, this policy, particularly in relation to ministers and former ministers, when we also heard evidence from Ms Richard saying that complaints about third parties which, in essence, is what a minister or former minister would be in this instance, are a fairly routine part of other policies and are included in our fairness at work policy. So, I mean, I think we can only repeat the evidence that, that both unions' view of the consultation process, as Malcolm's, I think, fairly described it as at pace, but fully adequate. We had no concerns. I mean, we've reflected on this as well, and in hindsight as well, was there concerns? You, you know, there's a lot of dialogue takes place that's not formal, it's not through official meetings, you're exchanging emails, you're having conversations around that. This was an amendment to an existing policy, um, so it wasn't unique, and as Malcolm's described, that in, in 2008, 2010, when there was a much longer period of time, it's because there was a much broader um, process and scope around that policy. So from us, both at the time and in reflection pa uh, since then, I think we have no concerns about the, the extent of that consultation or what it was dealing with. I, I, would raise a, I would raise an issue that you raised there about third parties. Yeah. Of course, ministers are third parties, but a third party could be a contractor working in an organisation. There's a very different power dynamic between a minister and a contractor. So, so in, in, in terms of those kind of issues, I don't, I don't think you can just talk about ministers being uh, third parties. It is a real issue around how employers protect people where they have no employment connection with them. And clearly there is a similarity there in relation to ministers because they're not employees. It, it, it wasn't me that described 
uh, ministers or uh, former ministers as third parties. That was Ms. No, Ms. I, I, I appreciate it. I mean, I think there's, there is a difference there uh, uh, around it. So, but again, I, can, I mean, we can only repeat, we, we have no concerns about that time and the nature of that, that engagement. Well, I mean, Malcolm yeah, will probably yeah, repeat himself well, here, but yeah. No, yeah, absolutely. So. Um, as you'll have picked up from the paperwork, there, there were elements that we would have liked to have changed or improved upon and developed further, particularly around uh, the scope uh, of the document. Um, originally, it was just uh, around sexual harassment. Eventually, it was agreed that it would cover all forms of harassment. We'd, we'd have liked to have seen it replicate everything covered by fairness at work for instance including bullying in the workplace that sort of thing but it, it remains you know fairly narrow just around harassment but you know i, I would agree with the, the comments that dave was making there with regard to the process anyway i suppose what, what i'd also be interested uh, in, in both your views on is whether or not we're in danger of over inflating the uniqueness of the challenges in and around developing this uh, policy or, or, or not. Um, Ms Richards also said that it would be very challenging for any workplace policy to withstand the kind of scrutiny and test that this policy has been through. And I wonder if you agree with that, given that the purpose, this is your bread and butter, surely the purpose of uh, workplace policies is at the end of the day, they need to be solid, sound and robust. <laughs> um, I, I think I take the point about, you know, ultimately this is most HR policies are not subject to the sort of either scrutiny or litigation that, that, we, that, we've, uh, that we've seen here. Um, I, I think we come back to the point about the unique nature of the role of ministers, the power of ministers, the appetite for um, politics to get in the way of issues in relation to this. Um, I think that's in part led us to here would be, would be my view. Um, again, come back to the point about, I, I don't think we'd be here if we'd had a fully independent process. I think it would have been less subject to, to challenge uh, or accusation around um, malevolent intent or motivation. You'd be taking all of those things and all of the politics out of it in relation to that. You don't normally deal with that when it comes to employees. You know, that, that's very unusual. Of course, there can be challenges and employees can challenge processes in the trade unions. We can challenge processes, but it's not usual to find ourselves at the kind of level of scrutiny that, that, that we find in relation to this. Um, and, and again, that I think is the lesson that has to be learned around how we try and avoid repeating this in the future and get to a point where actually both ministers and employees can have confidence in any process going forward and get on with the business in hand, the running government. In the, in the Scottish Government, they have uh, reason to, to question the application of some of the policies, uh, particularly around your know, um, uh, complaints and fairness at work, and you know just how how, how the policies are applied. Um, but you know, as indicated, you know, uh, members uh, generally don't have the same same access and you know opportunities to to, to raise and, and and for for the matters to be gone into in, in the detail that this one was but yeah th th there's regularly uh, issues around application in part the reason why i would possibly even go further than dave and you know suggest that there could be grounds for looking at you know a, an independent avenue uh, more generally rather than just around the ministerial side and that point, Mr Clark, about the application of policy, we heard last week from James Hines where he, um, in articulating events, made a differentiation between the development of policy and the application of policy. And I wonder what you both think, you know, wh where, where are the nub of the problems here? Is it in the development of the policy or was it in the application of the policy? Well, my, my feeling, you know, um, obviously, um, you know, it was, it was taken to a much higher level um, when, when it went to judicial review and, and they came, their, their view there. But um, certainly my understanding of the situation is that, it, you know, it, it seems to be around the application. You know, the, the, the policy itself, um, 
the, the actual uh, document um, it is quite clear uh, you know handling of harassment complaints you know how it should be applied. We still don't have any real difficulty with this. You know, my understanding is it's entirely on how, how one, one key sentence has been interpreted in this document. Okay, Mr Penman. I, I mean, I think it's an interesting point there because you can have all the processes in, uh, uh, in the world that, 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 that you sign off and depending upon how they're applied will depend upon what the outcome is. And I think if you look at our evidence where we say actually we say, on the one hand, this is the only part of the UK civil service that's had a meaningful process for investigating it, yet seems to have significantly more concerns about ministerial behaviour. Now, you'd say, why is it the case where the one place where essentially people can raise concerns it doesn't seem to be changing behaviours, which is part of the point of these sorts of uh, processes, about stopping people being bullied in the first place rather than simply catching them out. Um, uh, and so that is an issue about culture, about the, the uh, approach from those who have responsibilities in terms of a process and essentially how that process is applied. We would not say that people still have confidence in the process for, for dealing with complaints. We would indicate that the issues that we talk about are not historical, they're current in relation to this. And therefore that can only be a failure of how that policy has been applied, whether that's about individuals, whether that's about a broader culture, whether that's about the responsibilities for those who are ultimately in the most powerful positions, setting a tone for how these things will be dealt with. It's quite clear from our, our perspective and our evidence that the issues that we're talking about here are extant in relation to the issues of conduct of ministers and, and the approach from civil servants. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Alison Johnson, please, and then on to Jackie B. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, good morning. In our papers, we've been made aware of an annex uh, to the FDA submission, which includes an AGM report card. Um, it's dated the 22nd of February, and that report card reads that we've been struck by issues of trust around the organisation, ensuring that there is a space that is safe, confidential, and that there can be no impact on the career of any complainant. Um, your union also raised concerns that civil servants felt unable to speak truth to power and operated in a culture of fear. And when we heard from the permanent secretary on the 18th of August, she rejected that view and stated that she'd read the FDA submission with interest and said that she didn't recognize the term culture of fear and it's not a term that she would use. Were you surprised by that response? Um. Quite often, the, the information and the context that we get as trade unions is different from the context and information that management get in an organisation. You know, that's part of the point we touched on earlier about the kind of lived experience, is that people will talk to a trade union in a way that they may not with their managers or most senior managers. So it doesn't surprise me at times that there can be a different perception of what's going on between the most senior people in an organisation and those who are kind of applying and working in it and, and on a day-to-day -day basis. So there can always be that kind of dichotomy of views, and that's the point of good consultation with trade unions, as we have intelligence and information that people don't necessarily get through their, through their management chains. We thought very carefully about the language that we used in our evidence. Uh, we have sought to summarise a long period of time within Scottish Government and try to talk about the culture of the organisation over a decade is the sort of time frame that we've looked at it in relation to this rather than particular instances and clearly some of those issues may have been more prevalent at one time that, that, than another but we are confident in terms of the lived experience that we've tried to reflect in relation to um, our evidence that that was the viewpoint that members were bringing to us and as a trade union we have to take that as evidence and, a, and as fact if members are sitting down and talking to us and explaining that. I think that issue of safe space around what does that actually mean in an organisation when you're dealing with concerns around bullying harassment is a really important one for organisations to try and deal with. And as you've seen from the development in 2017 in the policy, they try, the employer tried to create a safe space that's outside of a kind of formal complaints process so that people can go, explore, discuss, issues before considering whether you want to raise a complaint or what you want to do and of course people have always done that with trade unions and again it's the sort of thing we've looked to develop 
particularly around the harassment field, but in places like House of Commons in relation to dealing with that? Certainly, in the um, written evidence from Prospect, they noted that um, there was concern about bullying behaviour in the Scottish private office. This had been a long-standing concern um, across a number of administrations. And in seeking to develop this policy, we've learned from our evidence so far that well, the Permanent Secretary told us that a final draft version of the harassment policy had been shared with an individual who later went on to make a complaint under the policy. Now, you know, you've, you've spoken at length about lived experience and, you know, obviously, you know, the trade union has, has dealt with a great many people over a great number of years and you will have a considerable capacity to share that lived experience. So was that draft policy shared with your own and other unions? And yes, I mean, it's part of the, 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 the normal consultation process. And do you regard that your view on the need to ensure the policy could never be interpreted as anything but independence was uh, independent? Was that taken on board fully enough? Um, no, because it's not an independent process. So, you know, it was, you know, in any industrial relations process, we come with a shopping list of things that we want to achieve. And, and you, you have to concede at various points things that you're going to get and things that you aren't. So um, there, I'm sure there were other issues that um, um, we raised at the time that, that, that we didn't get. Malcolm was closer to, to those negotiations than I am. So it, it's not a surprise that there are issues that we would have been raising, particularly ones that were quite unique at that point, including independence, that there would have been less of an appetite to achieve. And, you know, ultimately, you're trying to reach an agreement, um, you work out whether you're likely to achieve something or not, and then you kind of move on. Um, uh, in hindsight, I think probably we should have stuck to that a bit, uh, you know, dug our heels in a bit more, but that's on the basis of the lived experience since and what we've experienced elsewhere. I think at that point in time, again, we come back to the point, this was the only place in the UK civil service that had a policy, which we were improving, essentially. So, so, so you would have, that would have been the context in which you're judging any concession or, or, or change that happens. It's clearly your view that the policy is welcome progress, but is it your view that as long as there can be that interpretation that it's not being applied wholly independently, this could happen again. I don't know what you mean by this could happen again. I think... We could be in a position where the independence of the process is called into yeah, question. Uh, of course. I, th I think one of, one of, the, one of the, the, the largest pieces of evidence we've seen in relation to this whole issue was the Dame Laura Cox inquiry into Parliament. So it looked at that issue around bullying harassment and this very issue around the ability of those who are potentially subject to an investigation to have some influence over what the outcome of it would be. And hundreds of people spoke about it. And it was quite clear that the, the confidence in the independence of the process and the outcome is critical to whether any individual will raise a complaint in the first instance. And until you solve it all the way through to the final stage, people won't start that process. And so I think whilst we have a situation where it isn't a fully independent process, then whatever the merits are of, of what's happening in Scottish Government compared to elsewhere, you'll still potentially have that. People saying, do I have confidence that if I raise the issue, how it will be handled, how a decision will be made, what that will mean for me, some of those issues that are about power, you know, culture, but it's also about the independence of the process. Leslie Evans on the 2nd of November 2017 in an email to staff said, we will work with the trade unions, given their important role both in supporting individual members and informing the policy review. And then, um, I'm aware of a Scottish Government email on the 20th of December, which says, we will try and position things with the unions that this reflects their comments, but that the intent now is to sign off on a process for the investigation of harassment complaints. I mean, what do you think of that language? We will try and position things with the unions that this reflects their comments. Um, I think it's relatively normal language, yeah. I would say. It, I, th I think something that's been particularly illuminating during this process is, you know, as unions, we've had access to a whole you know, 
you know, a bunch of papers that we'd normally never see. You know, what's been going on behind, behind the scenes? It's been, like I say, you know, fascinating, <laughs> uh, to, to put it mildly. Um, and, you know, I appreciate you've had to go through, it looks like thousands of pages, a lot of duplication in there as well. I, was, I, was, I think I was reading that very paper only last night uh, that you just referred to. And yeah, yeah, <laughs> it was interesting. But I would expect them to be doing, yeah, to be undertaking those sort of discussions and, the sort of language, yes, you know, because we do go into it very much still as two sides. We're still aiming to work in partnership to try and achieve these things, but we do go in with different perspectives, different agendas, um, you know, and you know, each side trying to achieve the best they can out of, you know, what's available there. And so, yeah, that sort of language, you know, I, I didn't have any uh, qualms about it, but yeah. Yeah. Of internal discussions about management don't necessarily <laughs> always see the light of day either when we're going through a process. I mean, I think, mm -hmm. you know, this is a normal industrial relations process. You know, employers have to make, make their decision. We'll have a dialogue about what's been raised. We'll be having a dialogue about that. We'll be talking about that, and then you'll be coming to, to kind of reach an agreement. It's, it's, you know, I mean, we keep talking about an unremarkable process. It was. This, this is, you know, and therefore, at times, I wouldn't be surprised if on other issues... There are, there are emails flying about in terms of any employer where they're talking about the unreasonableness of, of trade unions or we're not going to agree with this. This is just the nature of industrial relations. Can I ask one final question, convener? So I just, you know, just for absolute surety, um, you believe that the Scottish Government engaged sufficiently with stakeholders, with expertise in the development of these proposals? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, can I ask, um, Alison Johnson and others have raised... Um, Nicola Richards having uh, said in her evidence to us last week that she had shared the draft policy to get the benefit of someone's lived experience. And uh, can I ask, were, were the union, uh, Malcolm, probably you ever asked, um, or Dave as well, were the unions ever asked to share the draft policy with members of theirs who had lived experience? Not that I can recall, but as we were mentioning earlier, in, in effect, we, are, we seek to represent some of that lived experience by what we learn from members in, in, in our daily working lives anyway. And so, so we take an element of that into the discussions. Um, but I, I can't recall any, you know, and, and you know, we would have, you know, certainly at the time the unions were discussing the document amongst, you know, certainly amongst the union leads at that time, but I can't recall any, any, um, you know, attempt to, to engage further at that. That, that. It wouldn't normally be appropriate when we're involved in the negotiations. It, it, it's usually between ourselves and with the employer at, at that particular point. Yeah, would, it, would it be appropriate then for a member of human resources staff to share this? It's not really for me to okay. yeah, answer on yeah. that one. I mean, I think an, employer, an employer has to work out what their position is. So they have to decide what they're going to do about whatever the issue is. And that clearly one of the ways they get that information and in context is from dialogue with trade unions. It's what we do. And we bring that lived experience, if we've, we've talked about our experience and the dialogue we've got, and that, that's what they get. But these are real world issues, you know, and relatively small employers. And so, I mean, it may be whether it's appropriate in the cold light of day, it's hard to say. But, you know, trying to understand what you're trying to achieve and, and understand what that means when you're talking about people, these are people issues. They're not some kind of abstract policy that about how this impacts upon individuals is what you're doing as part of that industrial relations process is what we are trying to bring to the process about our experience and therefore as an employer you know if it was any other management decision you'd be consulting and saying around the management team what do you think about this what are our objectives of that how do we pull in experience or information or evidence that allows us to develop a, a, a policy normally in the HR field that's that's through engagement with the trade unions. But it also may be talking to a management team about what an operational mm -hmm. issue is and what the HR aspects of that. So you'd expect employers to look at a number of ways of trying to influence and get experience and evidence that influences a, a, a process and a policy outcome. Critically for us, trade unions, because we think that's our legitimate role and there's less of a likelihood that an individual is going to influence things and you're dealing with more of a collective uh, issue around it. But um, 
it, it's a normal process for employers to try and work out what is their position. And when it comes to people issues, that, that can be quite difficult. OK, thank you. We're going to Jackie Bailey. Thank you very much, convener. Can I say to Malcolm Clark, we haven't yet received all the papers, so when we do, um, I'm sure there's more bedtime reading for you in there. Um, in the interest of transparency, could I ask, is Leslie Evans an FDA member or a PCS member? Um, that is um, confidential information, I think, so I wouldn't recommend you ask it, to be honest. Oh, OK. Uh, but whether someone is a member of a trade union or not is protected under the Protection Act. Oh, there you go. Well, I'm happy to <laughs> declare that I'm a member of a trade union. I would encourage all staff to join one. Yeah, I think um, I've just been reminded that Miss Evans actually said herself in her evidence she was a member of the FDA. Oh, there you go. She's declared it. It's, there you go. Thank you very much. Um, can, I, can I ask you a number of very quick questions first? How long did the Fairness at Work policy take to negotiate between the civil service trade unions and government? details it was in the FOI that was mentioned earlier but I sure. think it was about 18 months it was, it was 18 months. I think it was roughly from about December 2008 well into 2010 anyway before it was finalized okay and obviously the policy for handling complaints you said Malcolm was done at pace yes um, that was two months if that, thereabouts if that. if that so less than two months okay um, when were you aware that the government intended to have that kind of standalone policy that extracted ministers from the fairness at work policy? Prob well, at the commencement of the, the, the proper discussions, what was that mid-November, round about then, I think, um, okay. when we were starting to see the drafts. Um, okay. And can you tell me when the review of fairness at work was completed? Sorry, which? So there was a review of fairness at work? There was, there was due to be a... Oh. significant review of fairness at work you know that that was going to be one of the steps following on from uh, the specific ministerial and former minister uh, policy that stalled um, so in 2018 not it's not been it's concluded not we did it have is. quite a number of discussions quite extended um, you know negotiations actually but then then it largely stalled as events overtook really um, you know with with the judicial review and everything that was happening about that specific element of uh, well, that specific policy and so the wider discussion of it, because that was also going to be looking at the elements the ministerial elements that still remain in the fairness at work policy your know, bullying and other behaviors are still in the 2010 mm -hmm. policy you know, um, only harassment is in the in the bespoke and, and, one and i'm sure we would all one. agree all critically important but they seem to somehow be put on the back burner yes. that would be fair to say i, I think as malcolm says events overtook yes. as well yeah, but I, I think nevertheless, you know, there, there's an ambition. Well, certainly on our side, and I expect on the on the management side to return to this, because um, there are, you know, and we've touched on some sure. of this already. There's still a lot of issues with fairness at work. It, it, it doesn't really carry the confidence of staff, I think, and so there is a need to revise it. But yeah, we've still to, we've okay. still reached that um, point. Can I stick with Mr. Clark for the moment? You wrote to James McConnell on the 20th of December with amendments following the meeting with unions the day before on the 19th. Um, do you know when these amendments were considered? I don't, I don't. You I, don't, okay. Not offhand, you know, I might have some details, um, okay. but you know, not to hand at the moment. Would it surprise you that the policy was signed off on the 20th of December without consideration of your amendments? Mm. No, I, I, again, from the sort of papers that we've recently been looking at, yeah, it certainly got that impression anyway, yeah. So, so it felt like, well, certainly my reading of it, it felt mm. like consulting the trade unions was almost a tick box exercise. I mean, I know you say it's normal negotiations, albeit it was done at pace, but it strikes me at the critical moment when you were making positive suggestions for change, they simply ignored you and they signed off the policy. There were no changes made as a result of your um, involvement in that exercise. Is that correct? I, I think you also have to understand the nature of dialogue that we have. So the, the dialogue wasn't simply what happened mm. when we received the draft and sent amendments. There would be dialogue beforehand, mm. both formal sure. and informal, over a period of time. But, but, but at so the, the critical draft that comes, point, right? that there were amendments to, yeah. could have been subject to influence in, in terms indeed. of how it was created in the first place. But, it, but the, the critical point at the end product, your comments were substantively ignored. And that's what the papers tell us. Can, can, I, can I move on? Because 
there's been quite a few of my colleagues touched on independent investigation, and I think this, this is critical, as I think you acknowledge. Um, you talked about a meeting in December 2017. Um, who was at that meeting, and who kind of said to you there's no appetite from the civil service to do this? Um, from an FDA perspective, one of our representatives, I don't particularly I prefer not to name a civil servant who's a representative. So we had uh, an individual, we had um, nominated one of our lay representatives to lead on the issue, sort of stuff, and they were involved in, in the meeting. I think it was on the 14th of December, I seem who, to recall. Who from the government? Uh, it would have been the HR team, I think. Yes, Malcolm yes, probably yes, knows. yes. So it was the HR team? Yeah. Okay. Yes, w so would it, it would have been at that level rather than anything higher. Okay, yeah. okay. But they were clearly acting on the part of the Permanent Secretary who was driving this process? Well, they'd be acting on behalf of the okay. Scottish Government, yes. So, so would it surprise you to know that there were emails from the lead policy official, James Hind, and also from Nicola Richards and HR people to the Permanent Secretary saying exactly what you've been arguing for, that there needs to be an independent element in the investigation? It wouldn't surprise me because I would have thought as part of any policy development there'll be a, di a dialogue between the people who are leading a discussion with the trade union and the broader management team, whether that's permanent secretary or, or DGs or elsewhere. So that sort of dialogue going back and forward is no surprise really around how employers make decisions. Good, and I, I would have imagined the same thing. So, so what we have is two emails to the permanent secretary saying independent investigation, um, dialogue with the trade unions saying independent investigation, but the permanent secretary doesn't appear to have listened to you or indeed to her senior officials. Is that normal industrial relations process? Do they never listen to you? So, uh, of course they listen to us, and I also think that most decisions are not taken by one individual. So the permanent secretary may have made that decision, I, I have no mm. idea. We would expect most decisions are not about an individual, they're about a management team. And on issues that are pretty critical, I would have thought there would have been a dialogue across the management team. You're talking about, you, know, you clearly got an HR perspective and they front up negotiations, but in terms of policy decisions on HR issues, I would have thought that would have been, I mean, I don't know, the, the decision-making process within Scottish Government, but that would normally be the most senior management team in the organisation rather than one individual involved, obviously. If you're the boss, if you're the permanent secretary or whatever, then you may hold sway, you may get to make the final decision, but most decisions are taken as part of a team because the team have to deal with the consequences of it. Of course, but I think the cabinet secretary, uh, uh, the permanent secretary made clear that this was a commission from cabinet and that occupies a pretty special place in the civil service and, you know, it would have been her driving the process. Um, let, let me take you just in a final question, just off to one aside for a minute. Um, were you aware of the concern expressed by Cabinet Office to the Scottish Government about the policy? Um, and if so, did that cause you any concerns, considering that, that you represent the UK Civil Service? Aware. You weren't aware of it? No. Okay, thank you, convener. Okay. Uh, what's Murdo Fraser, who's been waiting patiently, and then we'll go back to Alex Cole Hamilton. <laughs> thank you, thank you, convener. Uh, good, good morning. Yes, it is just still the morning. Um, can, can I go back to the issue of organisational culture um, and Mr Penman starting with yourself in, in your written submission you, you made some quite strong comments uh, around the situation in the Scottish Government going back as far as 2010 and, and you talk about the culture in the former First Minister's office in relation to bullying behaviour how that became a concern for you and was raised with successive permanent secretaries and you say that some civil servants expressed to us that they were operating in a culture of fear and were unable to speak truth unto power and discharge their duties effectively. Now, when we had the, the Permanent Secretary, Leslie Evans, here two weeks ago, I put this to her um, and she's, she effectively rebutted a lot of your criticism. She said, I do not recognise the term culture of fear. It's not a term I would use. Um, and she went on to say, um, I do not remember ever being given a specific complaint from a trade union about a specific bullying behaviour. So I suppose my question is, is, is the Permanent Secretary in denial or are you overstating your case? So, as I've indicated uh, earlier, I think the, um, the information that you, you gain as a trade union, we've talked about, about safe space and the ability for people to approach us with issues are different from those 
that in any ordinary circumstances a management necessarily would receive. Um, and I think also what we are saying is that there were issues about the culture within Scottish Government going through a number of administrations over a long period of time and not simply about the former First Minister but other ministers uh, as well and that that created a concern about whether people felt that the issues would be addressed and whether they felt that they could raise those sorts of complaints through even though there was a process. That's that's our lived experience, to use, use that term. Um, clearly, those in positions of management in Scottish Government, um, as is, we have seen from the evidence from previous permanent secretaries, were aware of some of that, whether they were aware of all of it, whether they joined the dots, whether they would, would, would look at that and similarly take a view that that's a broad issue and a cultural issue or a series of individual instances of concerns. Uh, is a matter for them to give evidence about. I think for us, in hindsight, we think that that has raised issues about broader culture and that if members are saying what they're saying to us, which is that they didn't feel confident about raising concerns um, uh, and that those, would be, that, those, that those would be dealt with and addressed, then that's a very real experience that, that, that we've got. And if that conflicts with what an employer, whether it's permanent secretary or, or, or previous permanent secretary, say, I think that is not a surprise at times, I suppose I would say. You know, you quite often get a different view from what, what trade unions um, uh, experience when uh, you're dealing with these issues from which employers will, and particularly when essentially we're saying there's a culture where people were already reluctant to raise those issues, so it may well be that it didn't come to the fore for for permanent secretaries. Um, I think if you look at the number that we're talking about, that we've got, I think that over a decade, it seems to me that people in Scottish Government were probably aware that there were issues. You know, I, I think you can't look at that number of, of, of concerns and say that everyone thought everything was fine. Whether that is... In hindsight, whether that's something that perhaps could have been addressed earlier, um, uh, either by ministers or, or by those in the positions of authority in, in the civil service, um, is an interesting point, I think. But I, I don't think that this should come as much of a surprise to many people working in Scottish Government. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll bring Mr Clark in in a second, but maybe I could just ask a, a follow-up to that. And you mentioned evidence from other permanent secretaries. In, in the, there is an evidence from, from Peter Housden that's already been referred to. He does talk about how he uh, sought to resolve issues without recourse to formal uh, proceedings, trying to take action on, a, on an informal basis. Given what you've said, given that, and given what you said about a culture of fear, you know, is it possible that the, the scale of the problem is actually much more dramatic than the bare numbers you've indicated to us? And I think the numbers we indicate are pretty dramatic on their own. Mm. Um, and as we've indicated in question and elsewhere, it, it's probably not beyond the realms of possibility that, that therefore the number of individuals with concerns would be much broader than that. So I think it does raise a, an issue of concern. We've, we were specific in our evidence about it because it does seem, in terms of our experience as a trade union, representing the most senior people in government who day to day have interaction with ministers across government departments, it does seem to us about the numbers of people raising concerns in Scottish Government are so significantly greater than we're aware of elsewhere that it suggests there's something particular over the longer term has happened in Scottish Government. And our assessment of that is that that, as I say, is about multiple administrations. You know, this dialogue started in 2008 and it was about the lived experience of civil servants in relation to ministerial behaviour before the current government, essentially SNP government, were in power as well. So, and it's not simply about one individual, it's about a number of ministers. And that suggests it's a broader cultural issue about Scottish Government. Mr Clark, do you want to add anything? Um, I, I don't think I've got much to add to that. Um, I've not had any personal experience um, of any of the cases that you know have been highlighted or, you know, um, you know, led to you know, external proceedings and all the rest of it. And so, yeah, yeah, nothing specific to add um, around the, those sort of cultural matters that have been brought forward. I don't know if there's anything specific about, you know, 
my own experience, so I don't know if there's anything that could add. Yeah, I don't think I've got anything further. Okay, thank you. And, and can I ask you, you, know, you, you referenced the former First Minister's office, but in relation to that and other ministerial offices, are you aware of any changes in working practices that were introduced as a result of concerns that have been expressed by staff? I think if you could try and summarise it would be, and I think this is perhaps highlighted a little bit in the former permanent secretary's evidence as well, these issues were managed. You know, that's, that's not an unusual situation with employers and in, in the civil service, that when these things happen, you try and manage them. When we did, conducted our survey across looking at bullying and harassment, not just about ministers, but more broadly, it was often the experience of people that when they raised a concern around inappropriate behaviour, whether from an, an employer or from a minister, they would be the one that was moved. That's how you solved the problem. You solved a series of problems rather than actually stepping back and looking to address a broader problem. And I think that would probably be, I think, the, the experience of people. That's how things were dealt with. And that, you know, may be critical of those people at the time about whether they should have done something about it. This can often be something that you're dealing with the day to day. You're running government. You're, you know, it's a it's high pressure environment. You're dealing with those issues and you're just trying to manage and keep going, dealing with any multiple things. And at some point, you really should step back and, and look and say, actually, are we addressing the real problem here? And I think that's probably how these issues were dealt with over a long period of time. And that potentially then contributes to the culture where actually you're not addressing those behaviours or those patterns of behaviours or the cultural that is expected or accepted norms. What you're just trying to do is deal with each individual problem and solve that particular problem as it's raised. Okay. Uh, final question, Convener, if I can, uh, j just to follow that up. I mean, if there were situations where issues were, as you say, managed, is that something that would be done very quietly or is that something that would be kind of more widely known amongst your members, people in the civil service, amongst ministers? Um, probably both. You know, I, I said earlier on about when an individual raises a concern, gets to the point where they're actually raising it, whether that's informally through the union or, or informally directly, then what's really important is that they have ownership of what happens. Quite often, those individuals, if you say to them, what is it you want, they just want the behaviour to stop. And so, therefore, actually moving an individual is one way of stopping that behaviour. It may not be acceptable, or it may be, accept it may be exactly what the person wants to happen. They just want moved out of it. They don't want to raise a complaint, whether it's through genuine concern about what it would mean for them, or whether it's just, this is their solution, and it's important that you deal with that. The responsibility of employers is to try and address what an individual is raising, as, as their problem and their solution and try and facilitate that, but also understand, is that telling you something as an employer that you need to address more directly? So if you have 30 complaints from people about ministerial behaviour, all of whom say they just want moved, you can't say as an employer, well, actually, we've get, we don't have to do anything because no one raised a formal complaint. You've got information there that actually says there is a different approach needed because otherwise you wouldn't have those 30 individual problems. So I, I think that that is really, I think, the issue here about whether there was suffi sufficient information around those type of managed problems that should have resulted in a change of approach, either in terms of the civil service raising that with ministers and about ministerial behaviour and trying to address that, or whether ministers themselves actually have a responsibility about dealing with it as well. Do you want to add anything? No, no, no. no. I, I certainly agree with everything there. Obviously, we're dealing to some degree with known unknowns, you know, um, you know not being directly involved in, in some of these matters. But certainly, if the sort of issues that have been highlighted were brought to the unions, then yeah, we would certainly be seeking to bottom out those sort of matters um, and to get them addressed. Um, you know, I'm not aware of those sort of behaviours being brought to our attention, or the, the practices that were introduced being brought to our attention at that time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We're almost at a close, gentlemen. Thank you. But I've got Alex Cole-Hamilton, 
and our deputy convener who'd like to come back in at the end. Alex Fuller. Convener, I'll try to be quick. I'm very grateful to Murdo Fraser for bringing this back to culture because I want to bookend my earlier line of questioning. Can I take you back, Mr Penman, to those three layers of concerns and complaints that you confirmed existed in my earlier questions? Firstly, we have significantly more complaints about Scottish ministers than any other jurisdiction in the UK. We have many additional concerns that were being dealt with informally. And furthermore, there was such a lack of confidence in the system that many, many others would not even come forward to raise concerns for the impact on their career or confidentiality. Yet during this time, there wasn't a single ministerial resignation over conduct. This sounds like a horrible place to work, where effectively there was a group of ministers who were ranging around as untouchable, all-powerful villains and predators. So can I ask you, is it therefore reasonable to conclude that the organisational culture and systems of the Scottish Government at the time were designed to protect ministers rather than staff? Um, I think the use of the word predator is probably a bit over the top, withdraw, Mr. Paul Hamilton. I think you should withdraw that. I, I withdraw that, word. I apologise. I, I, I think a couple of things I would say. One is that the language you've used indicates part of the problem, in that uh, political point scoring is what um, uh, uh, often influences how these issues are dealt with and why politicians and ministers should not uh, have responsibility for. Um, uh, uh, marking their homework, home, own homework around that. I, I don't, I don't recognise the the the, the, um, the picture you paint. I think organisational culture takes place over a long period of time. There will be lots of civil servants who did not have that experience, as well as the fact that there were a number of civil servants who did. I th I, and that culture, as we have tried to indicate, also reflected different administrations and previous colours of administrations as well. I think there's an issue in terms of the culture, how that's developed over more than a decade in Scottish Government, where I think there's been a reluctance to challenge inappropriate behaviours of ministers. And that potentially, it's only my assumption, uh, potentially over time has had almost the, the, the um, effect of encouraging it because it's not been challenged and it's become learned, learned behaviour. Um, but that is not, obviously not the experience of, of every civil servant. Um, and I think looking at these issues in hindsight around individual decisions that were taken at time, as we talked about earlier, around whether you're managing a situation or whether there's a point in time where you have to sit back and reflect and say, actually, we need to deal with an underlying and more systemic problem, is the challenge that every organisation faces whether it's about the issue of ministers or whether it's the issue about their own management team or anything else um, around that. On a completely unrelated topic, um, when the procedure was first tested in its infancy in early January uh, 2018, um, when these allegations were first lodged about Mr Salmond, um, were either of your unions either involved um, in supporting complainers at that time or in the application of the procedure? No, we weren't. No. W would you have expected to have been at any point? It, it depends on the individuals, whether they were trade union members and whether they chose, even if they were trade union members, to involve the trade unions in it. Yeah, and certainly for PCS, well, um, we're not as centralised as the FDA. We've got 10 branches in the Scottish Government. You know, I, I wasn't you know, made aware of any such cases. There may, you know, may, there may have been discussions with other colleagues, but nothing came to me at that point, so I'm not aware. Okay, thank you. Thank you Can I ask, just out of interest, what percentage of uh, employees of the Scottish Government would be union members? Are you aware? It's, it's hard, hard to say precisely. Um, as I mentioned, you know, as is noted in the, the, the PCS uh, statement, for instance, we've got roughly 3,300 members. The other, you know, we are by far the biggest union, but you know, substantial membership in both FDA and Prospect. So I'd, I would estimate probably about 60% of staff, some, somewhere in the region, 60. What, overall? Yeah, overall. Yeah. Yes, yes. And would that be typical of, for example, we've referenced Westminster quite a lot, Whitehall, would that be sort of typical across the UK? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that would be relative. I mean, you're talking about, you know, there are three main civil service unions, so if you're talking about that kind of density, and then in different government departments, you, you have other trade unions involved as well, where they've got kind of different operational stuff. Somewhere sitting around kind of 50, 60 percent, I think, would be relatively mm -hmm. relatively normal in mm -hmm. places. Mm -hmm. um, you know, every union's looking for 100 percent, but, um, you know, big employers, 
with you know well organised um, negotiating processes um, and visibility for trade unions means you tend to have, and a lot of that's in the public sector, you tend to have those kind of higher levels of union density than you have elsewhere. Okay, thank you. And finally, um, Deputy Convener. Thank you, Convener. Um, in the submission from FDA talking about the culture of min in ministerial offices, it says that despite the support of the FDA, some members made it clear to us they didn't trust the Scottish Government to handle complaints effectively or to ensure confidentiality of complainants. And when the Fairness of Work um, policy was reviewed and included former ministers, an informal role of uh, a sounding board, a confident, was created. So perhaps I could direct this to you first, um, Mr Clark, just using your CSGU role. Was the, the CSGU role, uh, CSGU consulted about this informal confident role, given one of your key members um, had expressed this, um, this, I suppose, gap about um, having this confidential space? Not that I can recall. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, would, I would have to double check on that one. And would that be the same for you, Mr. Uh, I, I, my recollection in, in dialogue with a representative times that we were aware of the we were consulted about the role, not who was going to you know play mm -hmm. that role, but we were consulted about the, about intro, the introduction of that type of role. It's something that we would support. I think if you look at as I indicated earlier around the developments, particularly in the House of Commons where we've seen a development of something similar, a kind of hotline and that approach around I trying to create a to, safe space. to you welcoming it, but I just wanted to know if you you were told there would be a point, person appointed to take on that role and were your views sought on that? Uh, my, my, it was an issue that we, we talked about prior to the evidence so my, in discussing that. with our local representatives. And my understanding is we were consulted about it about the nature of the role, and it would have been something that we supported. But I mean, I can, we can double check that, I think, probably just to confirm. Well, given that, um, did you make any representation to, to, to see who would be in that role? What were their qualifications? You know, what would they be asking? And given it did prove successful, people did feel the confidence to come forward, and actually some of them went on to complain formally. Um, did you make any representation when this was suddenly dropped? It wasn't continued. It was best practice. It was what you'd asked for, and yet it didn't continue. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not 100% clear exactly what you're referring to there. So, you know, I, I'd, I'd probably prefer to take that away and maybe come back. Um, do, do you understand it's the informal confident Gillian Russell was the person appointed? Did you know who was appointed? Did you um, did they ask um, about her qualifications? Did you know exactly what she would be doing, who she would be liaising with? And at the end of the day, then clearly it was a success because people came forward and they made complaints. It's what you've been asking for, yeah. Mr. Pemmon. So when that wasn't continued, best practice, giving you that space, this confidential um, sounding board, giving you the confidence to move forward, the very thing that you said was lacking, was any representation made, should it have been continued? Um, I, I would need to come back on whether representation was made. I think, for recollection from a discussion with the, the representatives, we were aware of the role, we were supportive of the role. In many cases, you would, you would expect management to be dealing with the issues around appointing an individual with the appropriate qualifications or experience because that's what they're doing really you know it's a management role it's an hr role um uh that w whether we were consulted directly about that or had an influence to that i don't know but to some degree that that's a management job to say this is you know part of the hr field essentially you would say with that role and therefore they'll be picking someone who's got the time the experience and all that to deal with it um I don't know about the representations that were made in relation to withdrawal of that. I think we can come back on that. I think, as I've indicated, we are supportive of that. I think very much well, in I the field of there? harassment, that type of trusted individual yeah. who can deal with those issues and is part of a kind of employer, almost kind of counselling role. I understand all that. People. You said that. But weren't the unions letting their members down in not insisting that a role like that continued because it worked, it had been effective, it was dropped and your members then didn't have that support. People coming forward in future didn't have that support. 
it seems to me surprising the unions didn't make something of that and really made a very active case for that to continue. I, I, I and if we're looking, and I know, Mr. Penman, you've questioned <coughs> this committee and, and what we can do, it seems to me that that is a policy that we're highlighting that the union should have put in place to ensure continued so that these people who were so badly let down and continue to be badly let down had the very best um, facility available for them to, to talk in conference and to bring the concerns forward. So, so if I could respond to that, one, we haven't said that we didn't contest that. What I've said is I don't know whether we did or not, and I would check that. Secondly, as trade unions, we are limited in what we can achieve because of the decisions employers take. We can insist, and we may well have insisted, that doesn't mean that we get a, a, a veto on whether something happens or not. So you can accuse us of letting members down if you think that's the case. We try our best to achieve things in negotiations with employers. We very rarely achieve everything, and ultimately employers will make any number of decisions that we disagree with, that we have to live with. We are limited in what we can achieve. We don't get to insist. We get to negotiate, we get to influence, we don't get to insist. Ultimately, those are decisions for employers. Well, it would be good to know if you made any representation. Okay. Yeah, I thought we were coming to an end, but Angela Constance <laughs> is now insisting on coming in. The final question is from... I thought Alison Johnson was putting her hand up there. No, she wasn't. She? <laughs> Angela Constance. Thank, thank you very much, convener. It is a very brief question, and it's in relation to Annex C on the um, FDA submission. And it's an extract from an email um, dated uh, January 2019, I'm not asking you to comment around what was happening with the judicial review at that time or anything like that. But in that email, it says there is a mood of anger and despair at the conduct of human resources. Uh, and I quote, uh, human resource reputation not in a good place. Would you like to comment on that for the record? Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it, it's in our evidence. I think there was... Uh, a frustration that we had found ourselves in a position where that a policy in its application had been subject to a successful challenge. When you're dealing with these issues, I don't think anyone suggests that's a good place for an employer to be. And the, the, therefore, the fact that, that a court had found that that was the case in its application, um, uh, and therefore the, the, the challenge had been successful, has an impact across the whole organisation. And I think there was a frustration um, around that, and that's what, you know, given the timing of it, is the, is the concerns that we're raising. It's not where any employer, any HR group or any trade union want to be. You want these things to be settled, not to be subject to court proceedings and to be successfully challenged in court. So that, I think, reflects the frustration that in all of these circumstances, we end up with what we've ended up with is still this kind of period of limbo around um, understanding what processes apply and when and how they can be successfully um, um, uh, uh, delivered. If you anything to add to that, Mr. Clark? No, okay, thank you, convener. Okay, uh, I want to thank Mr. Penman, Mr. Clark, very, very much for giving up so much of your time. That was a lengthy session. It's very much appreciated uh, by everyone uh, on the committee, and um, that brings the evidence session to a close. And we now move into private session. <laughs>